Welcome to South Florida. Bienvenidos al sur de la Florida. Aquí se habla español. Uh, my name is Martin Vargas. It's an Hispanic name. Uh, I'm from that city that you saw in the last song. I, I was weeping over there, just looking at my city, Hollywood. We are in the county, Broward County. It's like Miami, but better. So it's just very similar. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is, sorry. You know, let, less traffic, less traffic. Uh, a famous actor, uh, a news magazine talk about his brilliant career. And he certainly was brilliant uh, for his capacity to play so many different roles. And I think he did it six times in just one movie. Six different roles in just one movie. That's, that guy was brilliant. But then in the article that this magazine wrote, if I'm not wrong, this is what they quote and they, what they said. The comment that was made was in that magazine that through the years, his own personal problems drove him to take on different roles, but in the real life. And he got to the point where he didn't know where the rules stopped it, and he began and lost contact with who he was. And also, uh, what he was living for. And that's sad, very sad. But more sad is that many church planters and pastors has been in that position. They have lost connection to who they are and what they have been built for by God and what is that he has in mind with your life and ministry. Uh, what is more sad is that the world the churches, even the denominations, uh, encourage us to play that game. And that's very sad. Who are you in Christ Jesus? And the verses that, that my brother Noah, thank you Noah for putting those pictures. It reminds me of my city. Um, and uh, Vance, you use a word that you know the rule. You cannot use the word real without any copyright. <laughs> you owe me $100. <laughs> Uh, it's a real storm. I said, oh, he used it. <laughs> he used it. Um, the letter of Peter is a manual of humility, of humility. And um, in, in the chapter 2, verse 4 to 6, he said, To whom coming as unto living stone, this sallow, this sallow, indeed of man, but chosen of God and precious. Yea, also as lively stones are built up, a spirit to have house and holy priesthood to offer up a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Amen. Definitely, Peter has written a manual of humility. A man who is proud is self centered. A man who is humble is God centered. And our Peter is writing to a group of believers that have been living in a crisis. And his encouragement word is to be total dependent on God. Totally dependency on God alone. And the rock that is Jesus Christ. So the heart of humility is holiness. And as close as I get to God, as clean as I am, much more God can work in my life and through my ministry. We will never learn what humility is until we learn who Jesus is and who we are in Jesus Christ. There was a Twitter from Matt Hensley that said, you are not who your biggest critics say you are, but neither are you who your biggest fan to say you are. So don't, don't listen to those voices, guys, because we are who we are, but it's because of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter, honestly, uh, in what foundation you are right now in your ministry, but the solely foundation is on the rock. And the only rock I ever met in 42 years of walking with Christ is Jesus Christ. And I understand that in a very early age of my life. The key of your life and ministry 
is to love Jesus more than anything else. So um, I am 61 years old, believe it or not. Uh, 44, I've been working, uh, uh, walking as a Christian. And from those 44, 42 as a church planter. Starting in my early age in Dominican Republic, my, 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 my country, because I've been living more in the United States, in Broward County, than what I've been living in my country. So now I have a, two countries in my heart. I have a divided heart, honestly. But uh, because I've been living so many years here. My first sermon I was preached, that I preached, was in 1981. I was only around 20 years old. I will never forget. For two reasons, because it was the first one and because it was the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honestly, if I, if I revise that sermon again, and it was in a, my favorite book in the whole Bible, the book of Nehemiah, an incredible leader that taught me many things and many principles in my own life as an entrepreneur and as a pastor, church planter. But in that book, in that sermon, I preached for the four seasons of life. I was searching in Nehemiah. All the time he mentioned in a, a month that something happened. I looked for what season was that. Oh, that was in fall. He said this in summer. He did that in spring. He did that in winter. So I, I wrote that sermon and I preached that. But uh, that day, that day that I preached that sermon, I knew that I was built for that. I was built for this. And... Um, Years go by, and I learned a principle even in Dominican Republic and here. If we won, I think we got it wrong. I have been telling for three or four years, as far as uh, Noah is inviting me, I will repeat that phrase, because it's the only way. We have the opposite way. Many church planters and pastors have getting the wrong way to do this. And what it is, I heard some pastor, oh, I want to plant a church in Detroit. No, no, I don't think many want to, to plant in Detroit. Let's say in Miami. I want to plant a church in Miami. They come to Miami to plant a church. I've been learning many years ago. The first, you got to engage the city. You got to love your city. You got to connect with your city. You got to know who your city are, who are, what, they, what, they, what they're facing. And then as you connect with the city, then you start making disciples. As you making disciples, you raise leaders. And as you raise leaders, then you plant churches. But we are doing the opposite. We're going to city to plant churches, and we don't even know what's going on in my city. When I came to Hollywood, the real Hollywood, sorry for Californians. <laughs> I, uh, I received an invitation as a church to do a candy parade that the city of Hollywood has been doing in that time for 55 years. Every Beginning first week of December, they do an incredible float uh, parade, giving candies away. That's the reason why they call candy parade. And then that time, the mayor, Mara Giliani, an Italian, I was mayor for many years of my city, uh, she invited the church. And a lot of people said, are you going to, to participate in that, in that uh, uh, celebration? Yes, I will. It was 87 different floats. The church won, number one, first place. The best illuminated and the best decorated float. And the mayor, city of, they called to, an, to all the commissioner, to the chief of the fire department, to the chief of the police department, to give us a plaque to recognize Iglesia Real, in that time was Iglesia Biblica de Broward, as the winner of the candy parade in that year. I don't even remember that year. And then when I was receiving the plaque from the mayor, she saw me in the eyes. I said, Martin, are you coming to defend your title next year? I said, yes, I will. I didn't know how, but <laughs> I came the next year. And listen what it was the blessings. That year was interesting because they put in first place the first winner of the last year, the year before. And guess who was in the front of everybody, all the TV, all the channel, just with a Christian flag in a Jewish community, just flying the, the, the Christian flag and giving tracks. I didn't throw the candies. I put in a little box with the gospel inside. And I invited, there was 35,000 people that day. From that day, I remember 
that Mara Giliani passed the baton to another mayor. Now it's a Cuban one. What's a big jump from Italian to Cuban? Trust me. <laughs> it was a great mayor. But I saw my friend, Peter Bobert. But then Peter told me, Martin, you coming next year? No, I retire. <laughs> I retire as a winner. I never participate more because I didn't have the resources. But it was an incredible. I know my mayors. Last one, Josh Levy is the mayor of the city of Hollywood. Incredible partnership. It's so incredible that he named it October 17, our anniversary. Well, we will be next week, nine years old. He named it the day of Iglesia Real in the whole city of Hollywood. I know, I love my people. But I don't care. It's my mayor, and I got to pray for them. I get connected. We get together. He called me, invited me to work in the, in the park, in the skate park that they're doing. I said, you know what? I'm a Baptist pastor. No, I don't care. Well, if you want to bring a rabbi, I don't care. I will preach the gospel. And he said, that's fine. So you got to love the city as you love your city. I got a big burden for you people. In the book of Nehemiah, the famous book that I preached for the first time in my life, in chapter 1, I just want to read a passage that got my heart. What do you do when you get a bad news? What do, you, what do you do when you get a lot of a storm in your life? Financial storm, health storms, even real storm like my pastor in Fort Myers. They're going through difficult times this week. That was the last church planting we did in Fort Myers. And the hurricane go to that community. And they have been hurt. I will tell you what Nehemiah did. In chapter 1, verse 4, he said, And it came to pass, when I heard this word, bad news, of the condition of the city of his parents, he said this, that I sat down. The first thing that Nehemiah did was sat down. Pastors, planters, like a band spin said, stop, sat down. Sat down a little bit. He sat down. To what? To reflect, to, medit- to receive, to, to, to process that bad news of the condition of the city. He got a big burden for Jerusalem. Even he was raised in the kingdom of Persia. Second thing he did was that he wept. He wept, honestly. When was the last time that you wept for your city? Honestly, think about it, just right now. When was the last time that you wept and you go around like we did two weeks ago and we did a walk uh, for, for life. That they call it love life. And I, I saw one of the seven abortion clinic in my city, in my county. And it made me wet. And our church, 50 of them came and were weeping, weeping. I couldn't believe it. This is happening in my backyard. When was the last time? Nehemiah wept. And he not only wept, he mourned certain days. Several days he was processing the bad news of the condition of the people. Next, he fasted. Again, when was the last time that you fast for your family, for the church that you're pastoring or leading or planting? When? When? And last, he prayed. Pastor Omar is one of the pastors in Iglesia Real. He's planting, he's my son, and he's translating me. He got a big challenge. Um, Because now he's translating not from English to Spanish. No, not from Spanish to English, but no, opposite. He's he's translating me in Spanish for the Spanish-speaking people. And I know it's it's not easy for him to follow me. But um, he, he brought a book a few weeks ago, and we distributed to the whole church. And um, he was um, talking about how to pray what Vance did, how to pray the scripture. And we hand that out to all the, the church. How can we learn to pray the scripture? Nehemiah was a prayer, a prayerful, prayerful man. And how you know that, Pastor? You only need to see how many things he did. In chapter one, he was praying. And he prayed to confess his sin. Hey, guys. Do you think you're still sin? We all are sinners. We're sinners that have been reached by the grace of God. But let me tell you, we got to go back and get close to God. All the time we sin, we got to repent and go back 
to the arena. Go back, get clean, get close to God. If not, I don't care what you're doing in your city. It won't be successful because we rest on the rock. Interesting, the, those that has been built for, these are incredible habits, what uh, Nehemiah did. Sat down, pray, and all of those things. I know Jesus Christ as my Lord for 43 years, like I mentioned. 44 I will be. But I'm still coming to Jesus. Weeping, confessing, asking for my city, asking for our church. It's not easy. I'm coming from your side. I'm a church planter. And I know what it is to be hard in the field when you're starting. And when you start the church, you see that the people that that you call friends, they get away from the church, that your right hand said, I'm quitting and leaving. When Omar started planting that church in English, he started with eight people. All our church planting has been around eight to 10 people. That's it. That's a number in the, in the, in the living room. And um, I remember next Sunday or two Sundays after, three of them, they quit. And then what was his first word? Wow. Maybe I, I, I've not been built for this. I said, I'm not built because of the number of people that we have. I'm not built because we are rock. And if you have everything by God, you will be full. You will be fulfilling his commission to you and your life. Don't, don't listen to the devil. The numbers, it won't define you. If God designed that your church will be 50 people, like an average of a Latino church, or 100 people maximum, um, if you have 25, 20, 30, I know some of the pastor, pastors here and planters are hesitating and knowing maybe I, I'm not being built for this. Yes, you have been, if you have been called by God. Don't, don't pay attention to that. But um, there was a humble life of a leader in the life of, of Nehemiah. I not only see his heart, I see was a humble man. And we need to learn from his humbleness. Jesus Christ is the biggest model. When we did in a small group, Manso Humilde, I don't know how you call that, that book in English, uh, meek and, and what? And humble? Humble and meek, whatever. You know, Manso Humilde. Uh, it was incredible how our church, in 18 a small group, they perceive how my Lord and King is a humble man. And for me, it has been uh, a model, and I think Nehemiah was a humble man as well. How I know? Because in Nehemiah 7, after he built, and you see that in 52 days he built the walls, and he knew that a city with no wall is not a city at all. He knew that. So after he finished his task of putting stones and bricks and repair doors, and doors are important in life, no? You, you know who to lay you in and who to get out. So doors are good, and he restored that. But you think, mission accomplished. Uh-uh, chapter 7, knew that he was not built for the next step. And who was that? Ezra. And then he stepped down, and he allowed Ezra to get into the front and lead the spiritual part of the life of Israel. He knew that he was with a purpose and with a mission. And I will do it faithfully. But now, as a humble man, get in. Get to the front. I don't know if you know, but many of the problems that Latino churches are facing is, you know what it is? And I've seen this in many states, in many countries. I've been planting churches, equipping leaders, and making disciples in around 40 countries around the world through Come Over Ministry, one of the ministries that I lead. But one thing I notice in our countries, in Latin America and in the United States, is that we don't prepare the next guy that is coming to replace you. We don't do that. We just, all the spotlight with us, and when I'm gone, who will, let the church choose who is the next. God used leaders. And everything fall and raise with the leadership. Honestly. And if you are not raising people, uh, making up, uh, then you will be in trouble. I don't know how many minutes I got. Oh, yeah, I'm doing good. 
All right. But listen to this. Uh, one, one Sunday, God put in my heart on July 4th, that's Independence Day in the United States. I said, you know what? I think that uh, I would do the opposite. I would do Independence Day on Independence Day, Sunday. Why I call it Dependence Day? Because of Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 10 taught me four lessons that um, showed me the heart of a man that was committed to get close and clean. Nehemiah was not just to build walls. Nehemiah was to build the men behind the walls. And then he said, okay, I already accomplished my mission. I accomplished my mission. And one of the things that I've been blessed in South America, Central America, even in Spain, is that when you travel in mission, oh, we are a missionary country. Oh, we have the most missionary heart, more generous heart in all churches in the United States. But one thing I learned, when we go to South America, when we go to Guatemala, when we go to Dominican Republic, when we go to Chile or Ecuador or Peru, something happened. When they see a, a green guy and blonde guy with a group of Americans coming, they immediately have a project. Uh, oh, oh, uh, we want to plant a church, but we don't have the building. Could you build us for us? Could you build the school? Could you build the orphanage? Could you build this? And you know what we're building? Asking, 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 asking. We have been like this when we're supposed to be like this. Giver instead of taker. And I'm not a taker. I'm a giver. So what I do as a Dominican, as soon as I arrive to Bolivia, yo soy Dominicano. Yo vengo de América. No billete. And then I would do this. Let's go together. What do you want to build? What's your dream? Oh, we have an orphanage to build perfectly. How much do you have? Uh, I don't have nothing. Do you have a land? Yes, I do have a land. Okay, let's do this. Let's take a project. You put a block, I put a block. And we partner with you. We go together. But it must cost you. Because if it not cost you, then you don't give a value. And if you don't give a value, you don't care if the building is in good condition or bad. And then I said, you know what, with me, coming from the Latino side, <laughs> that game doesn't play very well. <laughs> so the first question they ask is, but how long it would take, whatever it takes, but we are doing together. Know myself, and know yourself, because I know it's hard for many of those countries. So uh, one of the four commitments that Nehemiah did, number one, and I, I even did in our church, Iglesia Real, a covenant. And we put those four things that I will mention now. And we signed it, starting with the pastors and deacons. Let's sign it first, that we are committed to God to do this. Four things. Uh, number one, a covenant to obey God's word. For me, sola escritura. For me, Bible is my last authority. I don't care what men said. Is in the Bible? Is the Bible told me about that? Then if it's not, last authority is the Bible. Number two, a covenant of sexual purity in my family. I wouldn't give my girls, or my girl, I only one, to a non-believer. And I don't give it my boy to a non-believer either. So my grandchildren know you got to find somebody from Israel, from our people, from the Christian. You know, this is us. We cannot give it to somebody else. Number three, a covenant that Sunday worship is our priority. Sunday worship, we love God, we serve God, we rest, and we take time to invest. Uh, it costs you, Pastor? Yes, it costs me a lot. But more than me, again, to Omar, because he was playing with Whitton College and many uh, schools in baseball as a Dominican. Listen, the Dominican that doesn't play baseball, it's not Dominican. No, no. That's not true, okay? That's not true Dominican. So he was a great hitter. But then when the coaches said, we got a game on Sunday. When? Sorry, I'm playing on Sunday. 
You don't play on Sunday? It's a great game. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great tournament. Yeah, but we go to church. If it's after church, then I go to the game. You see how many believers I see playing baseball and, and playing volleyball and playing tournament on Sunday? No, we sign it. We are committed to worship our God on Sunday. We respect our family. We have time. And we will trust that. And last, we make a financial covenant with God and his work. Uh, and we sign it. You want to be part of Iglesia Real family? You got to sign this covenant. Why? Because I have been built for this. And you know when I doubt it, if you have been built for this? When uh, we are making assessment to church planter, we have been involved in church planting, uh, especially with the Spanish, Latino, even we do it with Brazilian. And also, we have been planting 16 churches in the last eight years. Sending or helping or planting. Many of them are sitting down here because they have been grow, go through the NAM assessment. An incredible tool. It's the best tool that I've ever seen in my 43 years. Incredible because you can identify who is ready and who has been built for this. We can make mistakes? Yes, we do. But it reduces the timing. If you are ready for now to do this, maybe you got to be a great pastor, but not a great church planter. That's completely different. And now one thing I notice is when I see, when you ask them if they will be cooperative with the Florida Baptist, one of the most incredible uh, uh, family that I have, the Florida Baptist Convention, or, or your local association, and they say, well, I would think if I will be committed. Immediately, I said, this guy is not built for this. Whoever don't want me to be participate, like this, why I need it for? To be like this? No. So honestly, guys, I only got 13 minutes, I think. Uh, everything must start with me. Everything. To build a community of believers that transform life and cities must start with me. I love Jesus Christ above all. 44 years, I fell in love with Jesus. I'm still, I got the same passion like the first day. When I heard that phrase from C.T. Stott, only one life. And when I heard that song that was written in his poem, lyric, I, I surrendered my life to Christ. And I said, I only got one life, so I got to give him all. And I've been giving him all for 43 years serving, planting, helping, suffering, uh, rejoicing. I love my family. I love Christ, but I love my family, my wife. I won't be here if it's not because my wife, Lisa. I won't be here if not my two children love me. And we have my two, four grandchildren. We love as a family. We see each other. We live all of them in Broward. I told him, that's a rule, live in Broward. <laughs> I don't want you far away from us. Because we love them and we love our church. With all the difficulties that the church planting has, we're supposed to love our people. Broken, yes, many of them come broken. And many of them will hurt you. And you invest a lot of them. And then you say, for what? Yeah, do it. Because we have a servant Lord that did the same. Amen. Unbelievable. I love to serve in a network. This is our family. This is our family. And I have network all over, in the United States, in South America, and Central America, in the Caribbean, in Europe, you name it. But I love to serve with others. I love my city, like I said. I love my city. I cry out for my city. I love to be in Hollywood all the time I landed. I know that I'm a real land, in a real land. But I love other cities as well, other countries, other counties. In, in, in L.A., I was lately, and when I heard the numbers, when I heard that 4.9 million of Latinos live in the county of, of uh, L.A., for me it was shocking because I live in a county that only 195,000 Latinos live, and I'm getting crazy with the numbers of families. If, if, if the statistic, and I'm not too much for a statistic, but if a statistic are, are right, and Nam said that one church influenced 1,000 people, 
and I have 195,000 Latinos living and coming from Venezuela, Colombia, Cuba, all over to South Florida, how many churches do we need to plant in Espanol? 195. How many we have? I don't even tell that information. So, and I think that I got a big problem. Hello, go to Los Angeles. Go to Illinois, to Chicago. And see the state of the church. And then you will see why we are in so deep problem. I'm only one brick. I'm only one stone in this building that Jesus Christ has been built. Building. Peter wrote that Jesus, the cornerstone, was rejected by men. The cornerstone was rejected by men. For others, like me, he is our living stone. And I've been building my life on him, up on the rock. And remember that I'm not who my numbers or the numbers said that I am. Um, one of the things that have been challenged in my life you know, when you are a pastor, you go to a lot of conferences. And I learned from a great friend two things. He told me, Martin, you will be in a conference that will be hundreds of people. Do two things. Like Pence recommended three things, no? Uh, stop, watch, look at it, and then listen. But uh, he told me two things you got to do. First, meet one person that you never met before. And trying to get close. Because there's hundreds of people. You cannot meet everybody. But pray to the Lord. Who is that person that the Lord crosses your way today or tomorrow and say, talk to that person and pray with that person and get close. And second, he told me, not only talk to one person, take one, one teaching, one thought that the Lord put you and burn your heart and take it home and apply it for it. Because you will hear me today. Probably you will forget it because of my English. But... Tomorrow, tomorrow we will have a Jimmy Scroggin, and you will have a Rice, and you have a Pete, uh, Ben Speedman, and then, I don't know, Ben is uh, from Alabama. I don't know if you will understand him either. <laughs> but, but, but honestly, honestly, it's good to do that. Uh, I, I, in one of those conferences, uh, I was in shock because somebody always asked me, where do you get Martin your education? Where I get what? My education. I never went to a seminary. What can I answer? Maybe the right answer is at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> but it will sound very probably unbiblical. Because I've not been present with Jesus. But in my heart, I've been building my life on Jesus and learned from many men around the world. Many men. From all denominations that taught me a lot of truth that get me closer and clean with God. But three questions always they ask me, and I don't know why people like to ask that. Number one, how many people are in your church? Okay, how many people? What is your business? <laughs> That's not your business. How many people? Well, honestly, I, we are a very decent church, Latino church. I've been sending all the time people out. And we still continue growing. It's unbelievable what, the, what the, the Lord does with that. But number two, second question, how much is your budget? What, what does it make a difference? How much is my budget? And number three, what do you get your education? Unbelievable. <laughs> what do you get your education? As Tesser, probably you know it, 41% of pastors, they're worried about their fam family financial security. 41% of you guys have now sitting down thinking in your financial security for now and maybe for the future. 18%, according to Ed Stesser, are stressed about their finance. 18%. You know what I mean? For every five, one of you are stressed out because you don't know how you can make a living in South Florida with the income that you have with the new church planting. Don't you think I know that? Don't you think I know that? I remember one uh, friend of mine that I helped him to start a church. It's the only Presbyterian church that I ever helped to plant. All the rest have been part of the convention. But uh, I asked him in one, in one conversation, I, I asked him, hey, 
John, how much, uh, how you get you, your financial, because I, I don't know very well the, the Presbyterian, and he's from the good Presbyterian, the PCA. So <laughs> I, I don't know how he did, trust me, if I don't investigate that, I probably won't be helping to start. <laughs> but he, he's good, and then I, I said, no, no, no. I need to make around $90,000 a year. That's talking about six or seven years ago. I said, 90 what? <laughs> How did Presbyterian get so much money? You know, $90,000 a year. He said, uh, listen what he said. If you don't make that amount in South Florida, you don't survive. I said, well, I'm a living example. Uh, when I left my restaurant, Tony Romas, I was making that amount. But when I quit and I start planting a church, I get down from 90 to 18,000 a year. <laughs> but God was faithful because I was built on the rock. I was built on the calling. Trust him. And I never, never, ever have gone to a sleep or my children without food in their mouth. Never, ever. For difficult that has been the storms, God has been faithful. And now I will... Betray him? No way, Jose. Guys, don't get pressured. God is good. And if you have been called for this, you will survive. Amen. You will survive. Maybe you don't see it now. One of my favorite players, remember Dominican, play. We invented. Uh, uh, America doesn't know, but we invented. The baseball. Um, maybe this is one of the amazing quotes that I want to finish. And I'm glad that this message came to an end. Because it's, for me, it's a challenge always to preach in another language. Thank you, Vance, for praying for me. Because I'm thinking preaching in Spanish. And in second, I got to translate even in my note. They say something, I, I, I forget, I, I, I change it. And I know it's a challenge for the translators. But Albert Pujol is an incredible baseball player. He's retiring. He played his last game, I think, yesterday. When he got 695 home runs in his record, chasing the 700 line, the only three men have been doing that in the history of baseball. And probably two of them with steroid, but, but, uh, there was three. <laughs> he said this. I translated it because it was in Spanish when I saw this quote a few weeks ago before the sermon was done. He said, it doesn't matter if you have 100 home runs. In the end, I know the Dominican people want it, and I wanted to hit it for them. But I don't focus on that. I never focus on numbers, and look what I achieved. I think we are too late in the race to think about numbers. If that happened, it's because it was God's will. And if it doesn't happen, amen. And I say, I believe that my career has been excellent and that the Dominican people have enjoyed it as much as I have. Question, have you enjoyed? And we are not talking about baseball. We are talking about the kingdom. Have you enjoyed so far what the Lord has been doing with you? I do, and I don't care. I don't care. We have 134 churches planted in Pinal de Rio, Cuba. I don't care. I'm not for the number. Some people ask me, Pastor, how many churches have you helped to plant so far? And I honestly say, I don't know, because now it's a movement all over. In Spain, in India, in Cuba, 38 countries, plus the countries that we have here, the USA. It's unbelievable, but honestly, I'm not for the numbers. At the end of my career, I'm probably is closer than ever because I'm getting old. But at the end, the only thing I want, the only thing I want is to see that I left behind men and women that will trust the Lord with all the heart, that will be close and clean, that it doesn't matter how much money do you have in your budget, that it doesn't matter if you have a building or not, that it doesn't matter if they raise you salary or not. That what happened, what is that you have? No, you are not built just for that. You have been built for the pen on the rock. 
And we cannot talk about anything else if we don't start resting on the rock. I believe and I trust God. So I hope that you do as well. Can I close this in a prayer? The only thing is that because I make a huge effort to, to preach in English, now you got to make a huge effort to pray in Spanish. Because, I will, <laughs> because that's what I want to, to pray now. Uh, honestly, it's, it's difficult for me to pray in English. I don't know why. I can even try to preach, but not to pray. I don't know why, because I talk to my father. And when I talk to my father, I want to get close to him. And the only way I get close to him is to say, Papi, Papi, te estoy hablando. Ayúdame. Vamos a orar. Padre, tú conoces mi corazón y cuánto yo amo esta ciudad. Y amo a los pastores que sirven aquí fielmente en Broward, en Palm Beach, en Miami, Day, con muchas dificultades, Señor. Especialmente aquellos que venimos, que somos bivocacionales y hemos tenido que hacer algo para trabajar, para poder sostenernos. Y eso no es malo. Lo hice y lo han hecho mis hijos espirituales, lo ha hecho mi hijo carnal y espiritual. Y nosotros estamos bien con eso. No tenemos problema. Porque somos givers, no takers. Oh, Señor, no sé cómo cambiar el inglés, pero te pido, Padre, que en este día podamos salir de aquí con la convicción de que si queremos tener buenas plantaciones, iglesias saludables, que tanto hablamos de eso, empieza conmigo. Empieza con mi familia que me está mirando. Empieza con mis líderes que están mirándome. ¿Qué yo digo? ¿Qué yo hago? ¿Cómo camino? Empieza con la iglesia que me has llamado a pastorear. Me ven como su modelo, Señor, y es una posición muy incómoda. Muy difícil para un hombre pecador e imperfecto. Padre, el alcalde, la ciudad, los residentes me están mirando. Y Señor, hay una línea muy fina entre ser una persona contra cultura y vivir en esta cultura. No soy del mundo, pero me dejaste en el mundo. Es irónico, pero es la realidad. Y sé que la única razón por la que me dejaste es para que pueda rescatar a uno más para Cristo. Ayúdanos Dios. En especial ahora ser network español que pueda señora hacer un trabajo especial en los Estados Unidos, en Puerto Rico y en Canadá, Señor. Padre, los números hispanos están explotando. Por así mismo las iglesias están cerrando. Ayúdalo, Señor, a que puedan levantar a hombres, hombres que estén limpios y cerca de ti. Que Jesús sea su roca. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén y Amén. Que Dios le bendiga en este día.